Okay, I guess we need to first start up, Matt. Can we find that? No, I don't know. Uh, we're going to... What's up? How do we get Mark's presentation up? Well, while we're waiting for that, a lot of you have the, the first chart in hand, and it's called uh, Nautilus X, and you can see it there, and you say, where did the name come from? And Nautilus kind of has a, an interesting background. Of course, Captain Nemo made it famous in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and uh, Admiral Rickover did some admiral, admirable uh, engineering work getting the first nuke sub under the, the North Pole, and then if you learn how to make cappuccino with the new cappuccino machine at 3 o'clock, you usually don't end up going to sleep until 2 a.m., and you come up with a nifty acronym called Nautilus. Anyway, that's non-atmospheric, which is key. It's a universal just, uh, transport. Just a little bit. Can you guys see the, see the chart? Yeah, I'm... I'm okay. Yeah. Okay, and it's intended for a lengthy United States exploration, and depending on the audience that you're presenting to, you can change the word state to state, because then it becomes an international effort if everybody wants to get on board. But uh, this is just kind of a collection of, of ideas that will help us hopefully generate uh, uh, some ideas for exploration, and in a, in a, I think sort of a larger concept than what we've been accustomed to in the past. Let's go to the next chart. Um, uh, put this aside and, and save it because you'll probably come back to it and take a look at it. But the, the two things that you should take away from this is that, one, we went in with the understanding that there would be an HLV. You name it, go build it, we'll be there to take advantage of it. It was our intention to build this in parallel with the HLV effort. Um, we figured anywhere between two and three launches, and we had an understanding of, of what the uh, volume and mass uh, would, would be capable of for getting into orbit, and so we took advantage of that. The big yellow box down in the corner kind of says it all, $3.7 billion, and a lot of people would say, yeah, right, 64 months. <laughs> we can't do that with the lion. And the interesting thing here is, like, folks, you need to go back and take a look at history because how we cost this thing is not how we did shuttle orbiter or how we did Apollo. Um, I'm a student of the lunar excursion module, the Apollo program. That was a spacecraft, and that is how we costed this. And if you take a look at this, there's some really, um, I'll say, uh, crafty and skinny engineering uh, uh, diversions from what we classically do today that make this thing actually be able to cost that much. And uh, the folks that helped me put together the numbers on that are actually pretty good and come out of the old uh, uh, shuttle contracts and and, and, uh, uh, procurement office. And, And we actually think it's quite doable. And uh, we're not being overly optimistic. We're, we're just expecting to be able to give them the opportunity to do that. Or let's go to the next chart, Max. So we're going we're gonna to kind of flip through some of these because you all are probably interested in the nifty graphics that uh, Frazzanito uh, supplied for us, so we'll get to that. Um, these are just good basic system goals that, that everybody ought to write down and take a look at and say, well, gee, that makes sense. Uh, let's collect them and, and not be too confining. The one key thing there that you see is that the crew is six, and that also, hey, look at the uh, self-sustaining operation period that we elected. You can do it anywhere between one and 24 months. Of course, if you're going to do 24 months, you've got to have a lot of volume for logistical support, and you'll see how we do that coming up here. The last bullet there is that we're going to talk a lot about the propulsion units. We are not designing a propulsion unit for this. What we what was uh, proposed is that this is going to be a vehicle that can adapt itself to a wide variety of, of thrust regimes uh, for different mission-specific um, applications. And so we can either be chemical or we can be SCP, we can be a combination of both. We can, you know, transit from LEO up to L1 and park there and, and uh, uh, take advantage of a, a depot if that's indeed there. Uh, there's, there's a host of things that you can do with this type of, of uh, mental gymnastics if, if you adhere to it a little bit, and that's, that was kind of one of our guiding tenets. Let's go to the next one, Matt. So, uh, you, you heard me talk about the uh, large volume for logistical store. Yeah, you need all that stuff there. Uh, artificial gravity. Okay, partial G for crew health, and also, folks, uh, GN and C. I, I'm sure everybody on, on this telecom understands what that's for. You take advantage of the dynamic that you're introducing into the vehicle and you use it. You don't overpower it to negate it. Um, 
true visual command and observed capability for the crew. In talking with the space and life science people, uh, because this is a long journey vehicle, um, you have to understand that just staring out of a, a, a six by ten window probably isn't going to really cut it for for mental health on a crew. So we've got some interesting ways that uh, we're going to address that. Uh, docking capability for everybody that's up there. In other words, CEV, Orion, or European Auto Transfer Vehicle. Remember, we can be international in, in nature. And the last one is really important because we, we see how difficult that is to address today, a robust ECLIS system. Now, that is IDA-based. Internal vehicular activity, we do it all inside. We don't go outside for anything. And in order to do something like that, you have to have a lot of volume and some rather clever ways to lay that out. And we're going to show you that as we progress here. Um, next page, uh, under attributes, um, pretty much basics that, that you can see there. Um, we do have a very large airlock, and you, you'll see that. And um, cell power, we, we said, all right, you know, we're still in the sales mode here. Uh, we probably will be forever, but um, the, the photovoltaic array and solar dynamic are certainly things that you want to look at there. And depending on propulsion uh, that's picked and the mission that's, that's required, you know, do we have to furl our solar arrays or do we have to fold solar dynamic type power? You know, those are, those are considerations that you put into your operational scheme, but um, we just want people to know that we're thinking about that and the overall system integration to putting something like this together. Uh, next, Matt. Um, more of the same uh, basics, but the last part there says, uh, the last bullet on that page is inflatable, deployable module structural designs. A lot of folks know TransHab because that was uh, something of a JSC development. Not many people know Hoberman. Dr. Hoberman, in my mind, is a mechanical engineering genius, and I uh, encourage you, and there's some, uh, in the later charts in there, you'll actually see ways to go and find out about what he has done, and I shared that once with some of the folks down at the uh, Langley and the structures divisions there. It's a new way of working, I think, uh, as you see it here, in concert with deployable uh, pneumatic uh, type uh, inflatable structures to, to get it to some really large volumes in space. And remember, it, it, all it has to do is to be a limb. Uh, we don't have to be an Apollo or Orion type of uh, module. Uh, we don't have that, that huge burden of, of reentry. Uh, nor do we have to take the, uh, the ascent dynamics because we are never coming back into the atmosphere. Thanks, Matt. Um, and then, so uh, down there at the bottom, uh, relative to Eclipse again, since that's kind of what we're, we're focusing on right now, you can see everything that you have to do all at once. And, and to accommodate that, we've, we've done some interesting uh, tests and closed loop systems here at JSC, and that's just your, your basic uh, uh, grocery store shopping list of everything that we know that we're going to have to do. And so if you take a look at that in the, in the next five years, as far as uh, how we're being able to um, not necessarily miniaturize, but shrink in some volume, uh, we still need a whole lot of real estate to accommodate all that, especially if we do it at IDA. Okay, thanks, Matt. Okay, so there it is. Lots of color, and, and you see something that uh, probably not most people are, are, are familiar with, but it, it meets all the criteria that we just marched through. The first thing I'd, I'd like you to take notice of is that the, the, the main core there, uh, which goes up in the first launch, is roughly 14 meters by 6.5 meters. That's really big. Mark, um, Mark this, uh, this is Harley. You're on, pay, you're on slide 8? Uh, boy. It's the picture of Nautilus X. It's, it's the big picture. Okay, fine. Okay, so yeah. I wanted to make sure I was where I was. All right, yeah, that's where we're at. And so, and so what you see there is, is the integration all at once of, of the centrifuge. Now, that's a 60-foot diameter centrifuge. We're not quite at 1G there with that. Um, that's at 6 RPM. There's a lot of design that's gone into the centrifuge. Um, because we've, we've worked uh, with Sam Poole, who's retired from space and life sciences, and uh, he gave us a, a lot of guidance all that. That is a, a combination um, inflatable Hoberman structure with, uh, with some hard structure aspects to it. Uh, we've come up with a kind of a nifty way uh, that you'll see further on in the back uh, of a, what we call a dynamic ring flywheel. Uh, which, which basically takes out some of the, the, uh, the flutter and rumble and, 
any any um, parasitic torque.